All right, welcome. Welcome to uh, Winter Bible School. So for those online, first, I tell you all, all two of you in here, to share. Get out your phone and share. Share to your page. Those that are online, we'd ask you to share as well, if you would, please. But we're going to throw a little curveball at you guys tonight. So those that are watching, for sure, this applies to you. Uh, I'm starting tonight because i got to cut out. Nathan's going to go second. But the video will not shut off tonight. So there won't be two separate videos. So when I get done, Nathan's going to get up and he's going to start his class. So don't bail on that first video. There's only going to be one video tonight. And it's going to run all the way through. So I can get ready for my trip to Dallas. And so I'm going to go first. So praise God. Righteousness class. This is where we're at. Again, no 10-minute break in between, so you can, uh, and Lucas had something going on as well, so that's why we're doing it this way tonight. All right, uh, turn with me to John 3. We're going to be b- back in uh, Romans 8 soon as well. John 3, Romans 8. We began our winter Bible school here a few weeks ago, and we want to continue. We said that we would call this class, we could also call it Not Guilty, Not Guilty, In John 3, 14, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. So God sent not, he did not send his Son to condemn the world. And again, it doesn't matter what preachers are preaching about it, what they're saying about it. God did not send him to the earth to condemn. I know there's a lot of hellfire preaching and brimstone and, you know, that kind of feel to a lot of preaching sometimes. But he did not send him to condemn, but to save. So say it tonight, not to condemn. Not to condemn. condemn, Right? Because condemn means judged and found guilty. Justified means judged and found innocent or not guilty. So Basically, again, we're looking at this as like we're in a court of law, and there's only two verdicts, the only two outcomes when the case is brought against you, guilty or not guilty. Are you condemned or have you been justified? There's, there's only one or the other that you can have. So which are you tonight? You have to decide, are you guilty or are you innocent? Which one are you? So God did not send his son to find the world guilty, but that the world through him might be saved. The world was guilty, right? There was no doubt about that. We knew that, but God did not send his son to tell us that message. And those that believe on him, so do you believe on him? I mean, there's qualifiers in the Bible. It's not for everybody, but it says right here, if you do believe, then it's for you. Those that believe on him, this is a scripture. And again, we don't want to run by it so lightly because here's the thing. If you believe on him, like it says, then you're not guilty. Say not guilty. Because if you do, you're not guilty. And I know many of us have, through the years, we've watched a lot of legal television programs uh, cops or, or you know, uh, SVU, right? Is that the one that, dun, dun, right, that, that little intro thing? Uh, you know, or whatever, most never having been arrested or in jail, but we know our Miranda rights, right? We, we've seen that on television. You have the right to remain silent. Anything you say can and will be used against you in a court of law. You have a right to an attorney. If you cannot afford one, one will be appointed to you, right? So, but do we have an attorney? We don't need to have one appointed to us, and, I, and this needs to be very, you know, it's important here. Again, how many of you know in your life if you get charged with something, it's absolutely serious? I mean, if, if you're really ending up in court, it is something that's very serious. If you get charged and found guilty, they're going to send you away. But if you're found innocent, then what? You're free. I mean, it doesn't matter what anybody else says at that point. When the gavel comes down and the mouth of the judge opens and he says, not guilty, then what does it matter what anybody else says? At that moment, you are free to walk out of that courthouse and go on with your life. Doesn't matter what anybody says or what anybody else is doing, right? And so, again, we're free. No punishment as well. And this is exactly what's happening right now. And in the future, there is a judgment day, right? We've heard that. Let's keep reading verse 18. He who believes in him is not condemned or not guilty. But again, if you don't believe in him, well... Those that don't believe, they're condemned already. They're guilty because they have not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. So is anybody okay without Jesus? Well, absolutely not. And that's why it's so important for us to be able to go and tell them they're not okay without Jesus. Well, what about all these other religions? Can billions of people be wrong? Yes, 
<laughs> broad, broad is the way that leads to destruction. And many are going to enter into that. Billions are deceived, and they're absolutely believing the lies, and they're lost. Their religion is not true. You have to believe on him. If you don't, you're guilty, and not really because of the sins of life. I had a friend that wasn't living in the Christian lifestyle very, very well at all. Uh, still living in the world, had all the habits that come with that. But there came a point when, you know, in just talking through our years, that he started feeling bad about some of the things that he had done. Knowing that, you know, as we get older, a lot of the old habits and the old sins and the old things that we did, and he was feeling kind of bad about some of those things. And I had to tell him, you do understand there's nobody in hell for that, right? There's nobody in hell for doing what you're doing. You know that, right? Nobody there. And he looked at me, and he's kind of like, what are you talking about? I said, listen, there's nobody in hell for taking drugs. There's nobody in hell for drinking or murder. All those sins have been laid upon Jesus. Every one of them. Jesus paid the price for it. The reason that they end up there is that they do not believe on him. That's why people will go to hell, not sin. I was raised my whole life sin conscious that if you do that, you're going to hell. If you do that, you will go to hell. If you keep drinking, you will go to hell. If you keep taking drugs and listening to that rock music, you're going to go to hell. That's the way I was raised. You really believed that. And yet none of those things are why people are in hell at all. But praise God, aren't you glad that you believe in him? Because all the sin, listen, the only sin that there is is not believing on him. That is the sin that will send you to hell. But I'm, praise God, I'm, I thank God that we believe in him. And if you do, then you're not guilty. Say, I'm not guilty. John 8. Let's look at John 8. The woman that was taken in the act of adultery. We know they throw her down and they're accusing her and they're challenging Jesus. And in verse 10, we remember Jesus raises himself up and he saw that nobody was there but the woman. And he said, woman, where are your accusers of yours? Has nobody condemned you, right? Legal terminology again. Has nobody condemned you? Where are the ones that brought charges against you? And she said, no one, Lord. Don't you think she was happy to say that? She's about to die two minutes ago and now all of a sudden, hey, Nobody, nobody found me guilty, and so Jesus says, well, good, but shame on you. You know better. You know better. This is the kind of stuff that we say all the time that Jesus would never say. We need to eliminate that phrase from our vocabulary, shame on you. That is devil talk. That is absolutely devil talk. Shame on you. I don't want shame on me. We don't want that on you either. It's devil talk. Revelation 12 says the devil is the accuser of the brethren who accuses, accuses them before God day and night. Always bringing charges, always trying to get you to accept the condemnation and to get you to accept the shame and the fault. And so here's the thing. The believer has a right to be completely blameless and shameless. This is part of the benefits of being a Christian. This is what makes it so different. How, how do you think that God's ever going to be able to come back for a spotless bride? We were always told, see, you got to quit sinning. You might be the reason why he hasn't returned yet because you're still doing all this stuff. Do we think there's going to be one day in the world that just everybody's sinless all of a sudden and he's going to show up? That's not how it's going to work, right? He, he, he's going to come back for a spotless bride, a worldwide day of repentance. I don't think it's going to happen. We're just, there's going to be that one split second when everybody's like, I got it right for just a, it's not going to happen. Everybody's going to stop sinning at that very moment. We can finally be clean. No, because we already are. We are already clean. We're cleansed. So many don't believe this, but it's what belongs to us. Say this. Say, I'm shameless. I'm blameless. I'm innocent. I'm not guilty. Say, I'm righteous. I'm justified. Not guilty. Now, is that you? If you believe on him, it says, you are, or are we just making this up? I mean, this is Bible, right? Not condemned. He didn't say shame on you. He said, neither do I find you guilty. Go and sin mo no more. He didn't say what she did was okay. See, that's the, the big lie from the pulpit is that that's a greasy grace message. I can remember my former pastor refused to preach on grace because he felt like it was a, it was a card for people to sin. Well, they're just going to go sin. And I'm like, no, they won't. They won't. I said, or they're already sinning anyway. You know, I mean, what do you mean? This is, you're not handing them a card. But they ref I know so many ministers that, that just, they will not preach on something like this. They have to use the guilt and the shame and the condemnation to control you, to bend you. 
But he didn't say it was no big deal. It was a big deal. And he said, don't do it again. He said, but at the same time, I'm not going to find you guilty because of it. Too many folks are trying to fix the blame on somebody. Jesus fixed the problem, and he fixed the sin. Don't be involved in fixing the blame. Romans 8 and verse 1. Romans 8 and verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. Again, are you in Christ Jesus? Then how much condemnation do you have? Right now it says now. There, this is a couple thousand years ago. On that day when he wrote this, he was saying, hey, guess what? Today, from here on, I'm letting you all know there is now no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. We should have none. No guilt, no shame who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. And so again, it goes back to, do we really believe that sin is stronger than the blood? Of course not. We don't believe that. We would would never say, well, my sin is greater than the blood, but we act like it. But what about murder? What about rape? What about abuse? What about harming children? There's going to be pedophiles in heaven if they've repented. Murderers, rapists, there's going to be preachers in hell. Sure. Who thought that just being a preacher was enough and never really accepted Jesus Christ? They thought that getting their paperwork and their, you know, doctorate and their thing, and they thought it was going to be okay. There's going to be good little sweet grandmas in hell. There's going to be Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts in hell. There's going to be Satanists in heaven if they've repented and accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Saddam Hussein might be in heaven. I don't know. If he repented, he is. It's just amazing to me how we look and judge things, and he's saying, don't do that. Don't do that. Jesus carried every bit of that, every bit of it. None of that is stronger than the blood. Not saying it's okay, but how great and powerful the blood of Jesus is, it's the only thing that was valuable enough to buy us back. It was amazing. Redeem us, purchase us. It was the only thing, and it was a requirement that a sacrifice had to be made, and you and I couldn't do it, and he didn't want us to do it anyway. He loved us that much. Nothing else can do it, just the blood. So you're going to say it with me tonight, again, because I told you we have to be a people of confession because Jesus is the high priest of our confession, right? This, he, this is how we get, the, this is the currency, right? What are we buying in this kingdom? What are you purchasing with your mouth? Because you'll have what you say, so what are you purchasing here tonight? So I want you to say this, the blood, the blood is, much is much greater than my sin, than my sin. Much, greater much greater than anybody else's sin. Else's sin. Let's keep reading. Romans 1.8, there is therefore now no condemnation. To those that are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. So there was a law of sin and death, right? That was a law. Now, how many of you know in the natural, we've made laws, and as things have gone, we've made other laws that kind of did away with that law, right? There was a lot of things that were put in place at one time, and then as time went on, we saw some other things. We made some laws that kind of overrode those laws, and now those laws don't count anymore. This is exactly what he's talking about. There was a law of sin and death. It was a law, and there, that's where guilt comes from because the wages of sin is death. Death is the punishment for being found guilty. But the law of the spirit of life, now is that a law? He said, but this law, this new law, this law found the flaws of the old law and said we got to fix this. So he said let's put a new law in. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has given me the not guilty verdict. And even though I did it, I did the crime, but I'm not doing the time. Jesus did the time. Right? Jesus did the time on that whipping post and on that cross and three days in the heart of the earth. Jesus paid. Right? I told you, he volunteered his tribute. He said, I'll do it. They can't do it. I'll step in for them because I know they can't do it. I'm going to do it for them. I can do it. We were found guilty and certainly... Uh, There was a punishment coming, and Jesus said, excuse me, I will do it. There is a punishment. Something has, a price has to be, it wasn't free. It had to be paid, but you can't pay it. Right? They don't stand a chance without me, I'll do it. So, now let me ask you, if your sins are paid for, then how much more do you owe on that bill? And nobody's asking you to pay it. But we're told that we have to. And then that makes what Jesus did just a farce. We, we make what Jesus did on that cross almost okay. Pretty close. By his stripes, you're kind of healed, and you're kind of forgiven. No, you did the crime, but he did the time, and so what are we saying? Well, you're off the hook. I'm not going to hell. How about you? I know a lot of people have told me to go to hell this year. I'm not going. I'm not going. 
I'm just not going. I know I'm not going to see you there because I'm not going. Right? Why? Because there is therefore now, right now, no condemnation, no shame. Verse 2, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do because it was weak through the flesh, it could show us again what sin was. That's what the law did, but it couldn't do anything about it. Man couldn't do it. No power in that law would be able to set you free. Only one thing could do it, Jesus. God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh on the account of sin, and he condemned sin in the flesh. What did he do? He found sin guilty. It was saying you were guilty, and he said, no, that's guilty. They're not guilty. I'll take that sin and the punishment of the guilt and the shame and all the side effects of it. I'll take it all, every bit of it. It was condemning us, and he said, no, listen, I'm the punishment for all the sin. And we understand that he didn't deserve it. And again, that's why we always say he took all he didn't deserve to be sure we don't get all we do deserve. He didn't want us to get what was coming because it was death, and God didn't want that for us. So the Bible says that if the devil really had looked into this and really had seen what was going on, he never, ever would have allowed them to kill Jesus. Because in the end, the devil, understanding how things go, uh, the devil thought he was winning, and he really missed it, didn't he? He thought he was killing the Son of God by simply doing what? Well, I know I just want him off the earth. If you're really the Son of God, and he kept asking him, if you really are then, then I've got to get that body killed because I know when the body's dead, then the real you is out of here. And certainly your daddy will take you back because I don't want you here. And that's all he was thinking. And if you keep sending him back, I'll keep killing him. I'll just keep killing that flesh, and I'll keep killing that flesh, and I'll just keep re-killing him every time. What he didn't understand is when that happened, and again, it didn't go the way that he thought, because he would have to give up that spirit, man. And he thought he could get on with what he had planned. And so, but it didn't go as planned because the Bible says there are now many Christs. When he rose, we rose with him. And where, where is he now? He's in us. Now he's got to kill all of us. Which is why he's always looking for a way to steal and to kill and to destroy. And maybe it's not even physically, but if he can kill your purpose. And that's what he's trying. Doesn't mind you being a Christian and loving Jesus. Just don't talk about it. Don't have any success with it. Don't mind you sitting there every Sunday getting all the notes and the, and the goosebumps and the stuff. Just don't do anything with it. And what he's trying to do is steal your purpose. That's the way he's trying to kill us. Maybe not just physically, but I think stealing our purpose is what he's trying to do. Because how do I kill all these billions of people? They're everywhere. When that punishment and judgment came, all the devil and the death and the sin and condemnation because he was innocent. And if he's judged guilty, even though innocent, now we can be innocent even though we're guilty. That's how Jesus did it. How innocent are we? As much as Jesus, because it's his innocence. We are as innocent as Jesus. The Bible says when God looks at us, he sees Jesus. When we look in the mirror, we are being transformed into the same image. When we look in the mirror, we ought to see Jesus. When we speak, we ought to hear Jesus. When we touch somebody, they ought to feel Jesus. Because this is where he's at. He's right here. And so really, it's his righteousness is ours, and we receive it like a robe on the prodigal son, right? Filthy, absolutely filthy, absolutely blew it, wasted everything his father gave him, basically spit in his face and said, I'll do it myself. That's mankind. But when he decided to come to himself and receive his father once again and to come back and his father received him, what's the first thing? Get a robe on this guy. Get a robe on this kid. I know he's filthy, but I don't want them to see that filth anymore. Let's cover him up. Now, we understand we're not just covered. The blood washed us. But back then, it was a covering, and that's what this was. He lost it all, but he's been found. So verse 4, that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. That was Romans 8, 4. So let's go Romans 8, 31. I love this set of scriptures. They're some of my favorites, and I, I'm sure you've all read them before, and I love them. In Romans 8, 31... What then will we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Now, a lot of times we turn that to say, well, there's no devil in hell. and there No, no, who? Who? Anybody? Man, woman, child, beast, who? If God is for you, who can be against you? You can't even be against you. Again, we're seeing legal terminologies. Because what does it mean if God is for us? Verse 32 he who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Look what it says. Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? Who's going to bring charges against you? 
Who? It's God that justifies. It's God the judge that declares us innocent, not guilty. So it's not him bringing any charges against you. So who's going to do it? Verse 34. Who is he who condemns? Who is he that finds us guilty? Well, it's certainly not Christ because he's the one Christ died. And furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God and is our defense team making intercession for us all the time. Making intercession. That's not him on his knees praying as we see intercession. He's representing us in the high courts of heaven. This is what Jesus is doing. All, he's the go-between. He's representing us in the high courts of heaven. One John tells us he's our advocate with the Father, Jesus the Christ. You have the one who has never, ever lost a case pleading your case to the Father. Just saying, but look at me. I paid the price, though. They're not guilty. Every time he has to look over, he's seeing Jesus, and he's saying, Dad, they're not guilty. Remember, you, you set that up. I'm, every time he looks at him, he sees the price that was paid every single time. You can be sure that you have, uh, have been found and will continue to be found innocent when charges come because Jesus has never lost a case ever. Never has. Who condemns? Verse 31, what then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? And again, he's talking about this opposing side always bringing charges against us. Always, always, always. Guys, you know it. Every, every day we have a chance to say, I've done something wrong. Woulda, coulda, shoulda. I should have done that yesterday. I'm paying for it today. You know, we have that opportunity. Those are charges being brought against you always, always coming against you. Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? Not God. It's God that justifies. Who is he that condemns? Well, it's not Jesus. It's Christ who died. If he wanted you condemned, all he would have had to do was nothing. Not send his son. Jesus not die, not carry the sin, not become the sin. Don't raise again. But furthermore, is also risen, who is at the right hand of God, who makes intercession for us. Imagine your lawyer is sitting next to the judge every day, talking to him about you and how awesome you are. That every time charges come up, what do you think the judge already has in his mind? They didn't do that. Because the moment you repent, what? The charges are gone. So when the charges come and we're the ones that are yapping about it, and the accuser's yapping about it, he's looking and he's like, I don't see that paperwork. I don't see any charges brought against that you're talking about. You're keeping account. We keep account. He's not keeping any account. How can we be found guilty when he doesn't even know what you've done? When there is no proof of it in the eyes of the judge in any way, if you've ever watched any court program, there's got to be evidence. There is no evidence of your sin to be found anywhere. The moment you've repented from that sin, it is gone forever. He doesn't remember it. You shouldn't remember it. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Now, these are often things that when I read this, these are things that we look at and say, where are you, God? You know, these are the things that make us think, I've done some things that have opened me up. That's how I read this set of scriptures. Shall tribulation, if tribulation happening in my life, does that mean that God's not there? Distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, or peril, right, or sword? When we have lack, God, where are you? What's, does any of that mean God's not there? These are accusations that are being brought against us. Yet in all these things, we are more than conquerors. You win every single time through him that loved us. For I'm persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Say nothing shall separate me from the love of Christ. Now say, I'm not guilty. Psalm 37. These passages are, are very prophetic in Psalm 37. These are the passages that describe in great detail the crucifixion and the resurrection. But Psalm 37, 28, for the Lord loves justice and does not forsake his saints. They are preserved forever. But the descendants of the wicked shall be cut off. The righteous shall inherit the land and dwell in it forever. The mouth of the righteous speaks wisdom, and his tongue talks of justice. The law of his God is in his heart. None of his steps shall slide. The wicked watches the righteous and seeks to slay him. We have an enemy. And it's not God, and he's watching the righteous, and he wants to get a case against you. He wants to get a judgment against you, and he's always looking. But verse 33, the Lord will not leave him in his hand, nor condemn him when he is judged. You'll be judged, but he's saying, not guilty. Every time that something comes up, not guilty. 
Say this, say, God is on my side. Listen, he's not against you, he's for you. Psalm 56 and verse 9, when I cry out to you, then my enemies will turn back. This I know because God is for me. God is for me. This is under an old covenant with worse promises. <laughs> we have a new and better with better promises. If he was for them then, is he for you now? Certainly he is. Again, think of a courtroom setting. Who's on your side? The judge. You know, he's looking at you, wink, wink, you know. I know we got to go through the steps, but, you know, <laughs> that'd bring you some confidence, wouldn't it? How can you lose? What prosecuting attorney would ever want to go up against the judge who happens to have the last name Allen when I'm standing in there? Well, that's my dad. The judge is my dad. And he really likes me, you know. He's saying because of this, what difference does it make then? It's all rigged for you. It's rigged in your favor. You have favor with God and man. You have favor. God is not sitting up there scowling at you. He is smiling. He loves you. And he's very proud of you. And I know that's a weird term to say because of pride. And I don't mean it in that way. But he is, he's very impressed with you. He really is. And he always causes us to triumph or win every single time. And we need to see this. Psalm 118.4, let, lo, the, let those that fear the Lord now say his mercy endures forever. Now, again, mercy is not for when you did it all right, is it? Mercy is when you have blown it. I've blown it, and he says, you get it anyway. Mercy. So mercy, I called on the Lord in distress. The Lord answered me, and he set me in a broad place. What does that mean? A free, open place. A broad place. Free, open place. The Lord is on my side. Say it with me. Say, the Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do to me? You're purchasing your freedom tonight. You're, you're grasping that. It's already yours, but if you don't push the gate open and walk through, you can sit there and think it's locked the whole time, and it never was. You've got to purchase this with your mouth tonight. Now, here's the thing, and I hope you grab what I'm saying again. Whose side is God on? He's on your side. And I want you to grab this, then whose side should you be on? Your side. Stop talking bad about yourself. Stop doing that. Stop talking bad about yourself. You should be on your side too. We're the ones, listen, any attorney is going to tell you when you go in there, for one, keep your mouth shut, and you're only going to say what I'm going to tell you to say. Now, has God told us the things to say and not to say? And we're always saying the things we shouldn't be saying. And we're talking about accusations against ourselves, right? And you don't want to walk in and say, I'm guilty. I did it. I did it. What, what can an attorney do for you? I did it. We're doing that all the time. We find ourselves standing against ourselves, usually accusing ourselves. If God is on your side, you need to be on your side. The self-condemnation. The reality is there's many people that are not on their own side, and they don't like themselves, and they don't believe in themselves. So they're always speaking against themselves or testifying against themselves. I'm nothing. I'm a failure. I'm gonna, I know I'm going to keep doing it. I know. I've repented a million times. I know I'm just going to do it again. I know I'm, I'm not worthy. I don't deserve it. And, and I can't have. And you're taking a stand, but you're testifying against yourself. And the reason is, is because there have been issues in our lives that have taken place, old words that are spoken against us. And we've received a lot of other people's testimonies against us that others have, have spoken against us. And we've jumped right in there with them, and we said, yeah, I, I agree, I agree. Don't say it. Whose side are you on? Whatever side that God is on, and God is on your side. And he is for you, and he's not against you. But you have to ask yourself, and you need to check up. Am I for me? Am I for me, or am I against me? You're going to be your biggest enemy, because really no other man can stop you. It's the day that you look in the mirror and say, they're right, that's when you're done. When you look in the mirror and say, listen, I know what God said, and I've got to start saying it. You've got to talk to that person in the mirror. Listen, I know I just went through a very ugly divorce. It was ugly. And the one huge thing that is a death blow to a ministry, my God, I could kill somebody. I could, I could murder somebody. I could drunk drive. I could take drugs and, and get back in the pulpit and repent and everybody be okay. But divorce? Dead. That is the death blow to admit God hates divorce. It's the death blow. It's the death blow. 
I could do all these other things, but you get a divorce, it's over. There's no forgiveness for that. How can you stand in a pulpit? Talking about accusations. How can, I've heard people that don't even know me telling other people, how can he think he can stand in a pulpit and preach the gospel after doing that? How can, how can he? Or while going through it, divorce is like a continued sin. You know, it doesn't happen overnight, so you're sinning the whole time. I mean, it's, it's the whole time. So if it's a year-long divorce, you are a year in sin every day, right? That's how people see it. You're still getting a divorce. You're still in sin. You're still in sin. And so we have people, ministers, old board members, staff, friends, family in the community, people that I've spent hours with, 3 a.m. at the hospital, casting out devils, raising their family members from the dead, uh, their kids, you know, and seeing them in jail and all that, bringing testimony against me, bringing testimony against me. And, and it wasn't great. And they took the stand of public opinion, and they said, he's guilty. He is guilty. And then they added whatever other stories they wanted to add. And I wasn't just guilty. I was really guilty. Re really crazy stories. And uh, just this last week, I post one picture of me and Michelle on Facebook, right? I posted one picture. Oh, Lord Jesus. You would have thought I posted porn. The amount of comments that I had to erase from fellow ministers and Christians, not the community, but from Christians and fellow ministers, I had to erase comments of things that they were saying about me because I was sitting next to a blonde girl in my Jeep. I shouldn't have been shocked. And I'm going to tell you there was a time that I was ready to walk away from this and say, forget it. I don't need to be here and I don't have to put up with this. And God said, well, why are you? Why are you putting up with it? And he wasn't saying stand up and fight against it. He said, who are they? What are you worried about? Who are they? Are you doing what I told you to do? Yeah. Then keep doing what I told you to do. Who are they? You worry about what I say about you. And that's the only thing that you need to be concerned with. Right? There was a time I wanted to walk away. And agree with them that, yeah, you know what, you're right. I mean, I had to fight it every night for a while. You're right. I don't, I, I don't even want to go upstairs and get it. I don't even want to see any of you. And I don't want to be up here. And I'm tired of it. No privacy. You know, you just want to walk away. You start to believe. You know, I mean, my God, I understand what it is to have paparazzi after you. I, I mean, every move I made, I can't sit down here and have a fire at night without somebody driving by and saying, I saw you down there. having." A, I mean, I can't. I have no privacy whatsoever in my life and I'm like I am done with this I don't have to do this I don't even want to do it but here's the thing they picked up stones and it did hurt and still today again just this week it happens again but whose report was I gonna believe about me because I'm sitting here going I didn't do that <laughs> I didn't do that I, but whose report am I gonna believe about myself was I going to listen to accusers and agree with them? Or was I going to be on the, on the side of Jesus standing there saying, who are they? Where's your, who are they? If Jesus were here, he would say, you sure you want to throw that stone? You sure? And they would have walked away and he would have done the same with me. Son, where's your accusers? Well, I don't, I don't accuse you either. He would have done the same. And to go on to record, I don't believe for a second that God is for divorce or loves it or encourages it or any of the things that people assume that I believe about it. I don't recommend you get one ever. Ever. It's terrible. Anybody that's been through one knows that. But that being said, what do you do? Do you fold up shop? That's what I asked this last person. Do you want me to just close the doors? I mean, is that, is that the only thing that is going to be satisfying to you and these other pastors is that I, I just shut the doors and leave. That's the only acceptable answer to you. Is that it? I can't do that. I would die. I would die. Yeah, it wouldn't be enough. They'd follow me, wouldn't they? I mean, I just stand in the courtroom and take the side. Here's Holy Spirit on one side trying to defend you. And here's the accusers on the other side. And I'm supposed to get up from the table and fire Holy Spirit and walk over there with them and say, you guys are right. Guilty. No way. No way. You eventually have to believe the report about yourself. Accusations are always going to come. Some of them might be true. Some of them probably are not true. But either way, there's always going to be something that's going to be firing at you. 
What report are you going to believe about yourself? How are you going to see yourself? Are you going to take the side of the accusers or are you going to stand with your attorney? Are you going to fire Jesus and stand with them? You have to decide. You have to believe. Matthew 12 and verse 37, for by your words you will be justified and by your words you will be condemned. Not theirs. The devil is waiting for you to get your mouth lined up with them. Then you're guilty. Don't do it. By your own words you will be justified. Not guilty, your honor. Not guilty. Or, yep, I did it. It's up to you, not them. They can talk all they want, but in the end, the judge is looking right at you. What do you say? How do you answer these charges? Say, not guilty. My accusers, even though there be many, the community and other pastors and preachers, families and ex-friends, no, it's my words. My words. How does it say they overcame over in, in Revelation? You remember that scripture? They overcame by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. That wasn't just good testimonies. Like, I got somebody here. Their testimony of their life and the things that they did, they overcame by their testimony. What are you saying about you? Are you for you or are you against you? So let me help you tonight, right? We got, we got, so you're going to take the stand, right? We're going to court. You're going to take the stand. The first thing you're going to do is smile. People hate that. Especially people that think that you're guilty. What are they smiling about? Because I'm free. And I know I'm free. You, so it helps to smile when they sit there and say these things. But I need you to answer this question tonight. How do you plea? How do you plea? Guilty or not guilty? Not guilty. Say it again. How do you plea? So whose side are you on? So say, I'm a winner. I'm victorious. I'm triumphed. I'm free. I'm, free. I'm, redeemed. I'm redeemed. You're healed. You're prosperous, right? What things are you saying? You have to overcome by your testimony. What are you saying? Because everything is trying to tell you you're not those things. Everything is working against the testimony of your life right now, trying to get you to say, I'm guilty in one of these things. Proverbs 6, 2, you are snared by the words of your own mouth. Mama was right. You'll have what you say. Watch your mouth. You will have what you say. Snared. It's a trap. That's what a snare is. If I'm going to get caught in something, it's going to be a blessing. I'm blessed. I'm prosperous. I feel like Joel Osteen all of a sudden. You know, I'm, ding. I need a little ding. You know. Come on. You know. But you know what? Is the man blessed? Is he prosperous? <laughs> well, <laughs> haters going to hate. <laughs> but the man's doing pretty good. Right? And doggone it, you know, he's having his best day. <laughs> and he is. I believe he is. I, every day's a Friday. It's not work when you love what you do, you know. <laughs> if I was any better, I'd be twins, you know. I mean, it's just like, wow. <laughs> yeah. But what does that mean? Snared means trapped and caught, caught up, taken captive by my own words. So if I'm going to get caught in something, it's going to be a blessing. Why speak against yourself? You can have what you say, so stop speaking against yourself. And, and, and others as well, don't be against them. God's for them, and we ought to be for them too, right? So what's it say? When I cry out to you, then my enemies will turn back. This I know because God is for me. God is for me. What can man do to me if God be for me? Is he for you tonight? And so that's pretty confident to say, God's on my side. Well, what, what, what do you mean? He's not on mine? I don't know about you. I just know that God's on my side. You're the one bringing the accusations. I'm just telling you, God's on my side. You ought to be careful. You ought to be real careful what you say, because God's on my side. Right? But we have to be very careful, and, and of course, you know, be careful with the accusations and, and from others. But again, in our own thoughts, those accusations come, and they begin to say this, that, and the other. And you've got to start telling them, don't you know who my defense attorney is? Do you know who I have in my corner? What shall we say to these things if God is for us who can be against us? Isaiah 50, something real quick. Uh, stop making jokes at your own expense. Man, I'm so dumb. You know, people do stuff like this all the time. Weak, ignorant, I'm a fool. Don't, don't do that. Don't do that. Change sides today. And we have to be honest and admit that we have been our own worst enemy at times. It's not other people that have to do much. Uh, we can be our own worst enemy at times. I don't need anybody else to bring a charge against me. Usually I can just do it myself. 
testifying against myself. And the devil likes that. See what they said? See what they said? Don't get caught by your own words. Matthew 12, 37, for by your words you will be justified. That's not guilty. And by your words you'll be condemned or found guilty. Your words don't condemn yourselves because you can and don't do it. Isaiah 50 and verse 7, this is out of the NIV. Because the sovereign Lord helps me, I will not be disgraced. How many, we can use some mind renewal right here. So because the Lord helps me and he's for me, therefore I've set my face like flint and I know I will not be put to shame. You don't have to look all down. And see, man wants you to look like you're paying for it. When something's happened, you got to come in here with your head down. How dare you smile? You know what you did. We know what you did. It's Lori. It's Morgan County. We know everything you've done. We know what you did. And why are you walking in here acting like it's okay? People want you to just look down. Don't do it. Don't do it. <coughs> the sovereign Lord helps me. Look, he said, I'm going to set my face like flint, and I am not going to be put to shame. I'm not going to boo-hoo and whine about it and feel bad and guilty. I'm just not going to do it. Because who's for me? Verse 8, he who vindicates me is near. Who then will bring charges against me? Let us face each other. Who's my accuser? What's he saying? Bring it on. Come on. Stand face to face with me. Let him confront me. Right here, verse 9, it is the sovereign Lord who helps me. Who will condemn me? They will all wear out like a garment. The moths will eat them up. What's he saying? You're here today and gone tomorrow. You can run your mouth. I just told this other person. <laughs> well, I meant it. This church will be here long after yours is gone. I can promise you that. I can promise you that. Because you're going to wear out just like this. Just like it said. Because all you're doing is pointing fingers. That's all you do. You look like a porcupine. So many stuff sticking out. That's all you do is accuse. Here today, gone tomorrow. What's it matter? There are charges. Who cares? Let me tell you, when you get on TV <laughs> or online videos, we just recorded our 456th television program, uh, this gives people from all over the world in different languages a chance to talk against you. I remember in the early years of television, and it still happens today, but it used to bother me before. It doesn't bother me now. But, I mean, we broadcast in 80 countries to millions of people on TV, and you want to think that everybody likes you. Now, Dion's one of the only ones that gets to hear all the messages that come into the ministry, and I send them all to her, and some of them are, are pretty funny, but I've had death threats. I've been called every name in the book. I, I, I've been ugly. You're stupid. You're a false prophet. I hope you rot in hell and God strikes you dead. I mean, these are things that come in, and these people are serious. If I had your address, I would come and kill you. People that are drunk, people that are high, people that are demon-possessed, people that are just really religious folk that don't like that I wear jeans on TV. I'm going to burn in hell because of blue jeans. Denim. Denim is not allowed in the kingdom of heaven, I guess. I don't know. I've been accused and lied, assumptions made, called all kinds of things. Weekly, this opportunity. And they say stuff, and you can tell they're trying to hurt you. And then I can add again those that just recently attacked us last year and some of those things that are more serious and... and um, you know, and I took some of them more serious than I ought, but the Lord again said to me, who are they? Who are they? I know what they say. I don't know who they are. He said, but you know who I am, and you know what I say. And he said, but what are you going to say? What are you going to say? Are you going to agree with me? He's asking me, are you going to agree with me, or are you going to agree with them? Well, I'm with you, Lord. And he's like, but I'm with you. I'm with you. You know, and that's a different game. You know, I'm for him, but he's like, no, no, I'm for you. I'm for you. I'm for you. Who are they? We get all upset over somebody that doesn't know anything. Say, who are they? Who are they? These people don't know you or the conversations you've had with God. They don't know if even if you've done it and repent. They don't know anything about you at all. Who are they? We don't have to worry about it. The complete Jewish Bible says it this way. Adonai Elohim will help. This is why no insult can wound me. Who are they? This is why I have set my face like flint, knowing I shall not be put to shame. He who vindicates me is near. Who then will bring charges against me? Let us face each other. Who's my accuser? Let him confront me. So he's saying, let's go to court and see. Let's go to court and see. No, no, we just had to do that in the natural. We had to send some folks some nice little legal letters that said, if you want to keep running your mouth, then we'll see you in court, and we'll see. 
if, you, if that's what you want to do, then bring all your evidence and let's go. Crickets. I hear crickets. Because when you put them down to it, they don't have anything. They're just running their mouth. That's the devil, right? Send me a man. Send me a man that we can, f blah, blah, blah. Who are you? You big mouth uncircumcised Philistine. Who are you? Running your mouth against my, he didn't take it personal, did he? He said, you're running your mouth against my God. You're not even dogging me. You're dogging my God. Now we got a spite. Talking against my God. He didn't take it personal. You little pipsqueak sending out a dog. I'm going to kill you. I'm going to cut your head off. He's like, no, I'm taking your love. You know, you don't talk about my God. You don't accuse. Let him confront me. Let's go to court. Who has a case against me? Step forward, big mouth. You're about to find something out. Because you know what? We've never been beat. We've never been beat. When my attorney gets through with you, you will wish that you had never met me. Now, I feel that way in the natural with Mary Browning. <laughs> I feel pretty good about that, too. But I'm talking about, I've got Jesus here, pal. And I'm telling you, you will never wish that you had met with me. I don't have to do a single thing to you. You're not going to want to have to deal with him. You're not at all. You're going to wish you would have picked somebody else that testified against themselves. That's not me. I'm not doing that. I'm not guilty. I'm innocent, and I don't deserve any punishment, and you can take it up with my lawyer. Proverbs 17, 15, he who justifies the wicked and he who condemns the just, both of them alike are an abomination to the Lord. You see, hear what it said. He who justifies the wicked and condemns the just, both are like an abomination to the Lord. Oh, we want to talk about other things that are an abomination. What about this? You better watch your mouth. Proverbs 17, 15, we got to watch our mouths. We might be calling the just guilty and the guilty, you know, that are just. We need to watch our mouths. If the Lord has justified us by what Jesus has done, who's going to call you guilty when he said it's justified? And those do, they're an abomination to him. And that's strong language there, that somebody that's calling justified, guilty, and condemned, that's pretty rough. If he says that you're innocent, you are. And again, who, who's more important than him? We put way too much into what somebody else is saying. What somebody else is saying. And again, we don't want to talk about each other. You know, Peter got that revelation when he was on that, on that rooftop. Don't call common what I've called clean. Don't call it common. Don't you call guilty what I've justified. You're saying God is wrong. I don't think we would ever get in God's face and say, you're wrong. You're wrong. And you're wrong about them. I don't think we would do that. So here's your homework this week. Read Romans 5. And I didn't put it on there, but go ahead and read Romans 6 as well. You'll be glad that you did. We don't excuse sin, but we don't keep sinning. But there's grace when you do, and you need to read that this week. Isaiah, the complete Jewish Bible. And again, for far too long, there's been condemning, uh, uh, preached and nurtured in the church. There has been. And it's a huge part of, of most churches and people's lives. And it's a major motivating factor, I think, for a lot of ministers weekly. I know I came out of that. My own family members that were pastors, that's how they did it. We were just taught that way. You have to use guilt and condemnation and shame, you know, to get people to, you know, you volunteer or you better give till it hurts or, you know, I mean, there was always a, you know, you better. And we were required to be there, especially as family. You were required to be there. And it didn't matter what else you had going on, because if you don't, then you're not really serious about the Lord. And, you know, you need to be here every time the doors are open. It was just guilt and shame and condemnation. And it happens every Sunday. Don't be a part of it and don't do it. Uh, what we do is love. But it's sad to me that Christian people reverence guilt. I watched it for years. They reverence that kind of thing. Oh, they're such a good, strong preacher. No, they're guilting you. They're beating you up right now. That's not strong preaching. They're beating you up. That's why here at the MHC, we could guilt people. In, I mean, we need help like any other church, but I'm not going to guilt you into it. You know, we really could really use somebody, Ricky, to finish that, finish that room down there, Ricky. You know, I'm <laughs> I didn't have to, I didn't have to, I didn't have to guilt Ricky and Johnny Lee into coming and building the room downstairs that you all need to go look at when we're done here. But right, that's how it should be. Is that we want to take ownership? This belongs to us. What the guilt thing does is, is it belongs to me, and you all should take it serious. I've been charged with this, and you all need to help me out. This isn't mine. I could walk out the door. to. The, I don't even own the building. You understand that? It's board owned. Like, I don't own anything here. It's board owned. 
which is a good thing. You never get that idea that, well, my name's on the bottom line, and that's what we always heard. My name's on the bottom line, and you have to help me. Because if it goes down, I'm going down, and I'm taking you with me. We're not going down. We're not going down. And if I step out, he steps in. It's, it's, a, it's so easy. We're never going down, ever. But again, don't be so quick to accept guilt, right? Don't accept it. Don't accept blame. Don't accept that. Do not tolerate it in your life. We saw that Paul, when he was Saul, he was guilty, right? He's killing Christians. He's doing all that. But what did he do? Remember, he walked into that place, and they said, what's he doing here? Now, he's already repented and, and been born again, right? He got knocked off, off there. He saw the light. He got healed. He accepts Jesus Christ. And he walks in, and those guys didn't know that. And they're like, what's he doing here? They were trying to place guilt back on him. And he's like, that ain't me anymore. That's not me anymore. I don't accept that. I don't accept that. Don't let people do that to you. Isaiah 54, 14, in righteousness you will be established far from oppression with nothing to fear, far from ruin, for it will not come near you because you're established in right standing. How much more we got? Oh, there's a lot. Uh, not that much. Okay, I'm going to keep going. We're almost there. Now I don't remember where I was. But again, we know this. On the flip side, don't talk about anybody. Don't you talk about anybody. Don't be an accuser. Don't do that. God takes it very serious. You know, we like to quote, touch not thine anointed. And we only do that usually when we're talking about the preacher. Friends, every one of you is anointed. Your brothers and your sisters, we're all anointed. We cannot be talking about one another. And I'm even talking about the places that I don't care for and the ones that come against me. Guys, I can't. I remember when I was so mad at my father-in-law for the things that he was doing. And God asked me one day, well, what would you like me to do? Shut his church down? That, is that what you want? You want me to shut his place down? Is that what you want? Because then what are you going to do with so-and-so that goes there? Because they need that. That's their church. What are you going to do with this one that goes there? That's their church. You may not be getting anything, but they're getting something. You want me to shut that down? What are you going to do with all them? And I wasn't so prideful to say, well, they need to come here. Not at all. God places people, right, where they need to be. That's what the Bible says until he releases you to go. And I was like, yeah, I can't speak against them. Even if they're coming against you, right? The Bible says to do what to people like that? Bless them. Bless them. I've had to pray a lot of blessing lately for folk. No weapon made will prevail against you. It can't. In the course, refute every accusation. The servants of Adonai inherit all of this. The reward for their righteousness is from me, says Adonai. So how do we plead tonight? Not guilty. Matthew 12, again, we're almost done. Alone, let me say this, 1 Timothy 5, 19. Do not receive an accusation against an elder except for two or three witnesses. What's that saying? Don't just, what do we do? We're so quick to just say, Hey, man, did you hear about something? Oh, I know, man. You know, I always kind of thought that. You know, I always kind of thought there was something weird about them. Don't do that. You are jumping right in with accusation. You don't even know what's going on. You don't even know if that person's making it up. Now, if two or three witnesses and it actually plays out, then there's a biblical way to deal with stuff, which is still not to do this. Guilty and guilty. That's not how the Bible says to do it. It's actually to be done in private if there really is an issue, not all over Facebook and not all over everybody else and blabbing about it. If there really is an issue, there's a biblical way to handle it. But most of the time there isn't. It's hearsay. And we just say, yeah, I kind of always, I kind of always thought that too. You know, don't do that. You believe the best in people. Believe the best. Why are we always so quick to believe the worst? Be like, I don't, I don't believe that. Why can't we ever just say that? I don't believe any of that. I don't, I don't see that. I don't see that. Even if they did miss it, are you for them or against them, right? Because I still need their callings and their giftings and the things that God has in their life. And as part of the body, if I stub my toe, I don't just cut it off. But the, the Christian world is the only people that kill their wounded. They kill them. You're dead to me. Bye. I don't, we can't have that. We have to restore them because we need them. We need them as part of the body. We got to have these people as part of the body. Who's against them? Well, God's not bringing accusations against them, and Jesus isn't, so don't you do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. Matthew 12, 7, but if you had known what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless. 
And he's talking about himself, how wrong it was to accuse them of guilt. Well, whose righteousness do we have now? Well, we have his. We know that. And, and so it would be just as wrong to accuse us because, again, we are guiltless because he was. And if he gave us that righteousness, then you are righteous. You're righteous, and you have to start speaking the truth about yourself. If you're testifying against yourself, you're testifying against him. We can't do that anymore. Verse 37, for by your words you will be justified and acquitted. By your words you will be condemned and sentenced. So again, do you believe tonight we ought to be watching what comes out of our mouths? I mean, to be righteous, we need to walk as though we are. You need to own that because that is a, you are testifying. That is your testimony of his righteousness is played out in how righteous you are. How righteous you act is a direct reflection of the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And we view him that way. We have to view ourselves that way. We have to. So say this tonight. We're closing right here. Say, I will not ever be involved with accusations against another or myself. I am blessed. I'm free. I'm justified. I'm righteous in Jesus' name. We're going to take about just a couple minute break. Those that are online, do not go anywhere. We're not shutting the video off. We're not closing it down. We're just going to let it run while Nathan gets his stuff up here, and I'm going to step off, and we're going to keep things running. If you guys need to get up for a minute, you can. But, again, the video will not shut off, so you all stay right there with us tonight.
All right. Good evening, everybody. Let's do this. Let's do Faith Foundations. Week three. Going to enjoy this tonight. Tonight is going to be the action of faith. Faith does have an action. Well, how do we know? Well, the Bible says that. The Bible puts out there very plainly many people in the Gospels, in the Bible, that had the action of faith. You see, you can see faith in action. Faith is not lazy and it is not passive. It is at peace but also aggressive and it will never quit and it will never give up or give in. It will not do it. Not when it's backbone and the foundation is the word of God. It will not. Faith doesn't take no for an answer. It presses in and it goes and it gets what it once it has a desired result and it goes and gets right then and there what it knows it can get how do we know that well the bible tells us that what about the woman with the issue of blood what about mark chapter 5 verses 25 through 34 now i'm gonna you'll pick up what she said and what she did what she did because of what she said now in the crowd that day was a woman who had suffered horribly from continual bleeding for 12 long years. She had endured a great deal under the care of various doctors, yet in spite of spending all that she had on their treatments, she was getting worse instead of better. Get this. When she had heard about Jesus' healing power, she pushed through the crowd and came up from behind him and touched his prayer shawl. For she kept saying to herself, if I could touch even his clothes, I know that I will be healed. As soon as her hand touched him, her bleeding immediately stopped. She put action to what she was saying. She didn't just say it and stay at home, sick under the covers in bed, continually bleeding. No, she got up and she did something with what she said. And here's the thing, when we go through and we examine and we break this thing apart, how many people were around Jesus in that moment? A lot of people. A lot of people were pressing in and touching. They say thronging Jesus. There were so many people up against Jesus, but though he only noticed the touch of one, because Jesus notices the touch of faith. Out of all those people, said she knew it. For she could feel in her body, instantly being healed of her disease. Jesus knew at once that someone had touched him, for he felt the power that always surged around him had passed through him for someone to be healed. He turned and spoke to the crowd, saying, Who touched my clothes? His disciples answered, What do you mean who touched you? Look at this huge crowd. They're all pressing up against you. But Jesus' eyes swept across the crowd, looking for the one who had touched him for healing. When the woman who experienced this incredible miracle realized what had happened to her, she came before him trembling with fear and threw herself down at his feet saying, I was the one who touched you. And she told him her story of what had just happened. Then Jesus said to her, daughter, because you dared to believe, your faith has healed you. Go with peace in your heart and be free from your struggling. My friends, by this time in her life, she had already endured much pain and suffering and had spent all of her money and savings. She had lost trust in medical doctors, but she had heard of someone else that is healing all manner of sickness and disease. She had heard of Jesus and the many miracles that was he was manifesting. She started to dream and to see herself free of this long suffering and bleeding day and night. She started to see what it would look like to be the next person who touches Jesus and gets healed and delivered of that horrible plague. Faith in her heart led her to start speaking out what she wanted and what she was willing and going to do and what she desired. Finally, the day came when she would make her way to Jesus. When she got there, she noticed that there was way too many people crowded up against him. For the people were many in numbers. She refused to quit or go back home with the same condition that she came to meet Jesus with. She knelt down and crowded that and crawled against that crowded 
group of people upon our hands and knees pushing through all the people while getting stepped upon and getting dirt kicked in her face. She still continued to make her way to her healing and finally reached out when Jesus was close enough and touched him. Filled with power and virtue, Jesus noticed the touch of faith. Everybody was pushing in and touching Jesus that day. But this was a different touch. A touch of faith that pulled on the power of God from him to annihilate the flow of blood and bring it to a complete stop in its tracks. Jesus noticed this touch of faith and told the woman, go your way for your faith has healed you. Faith has an action. Faith in this story refused to go home the same way that it came. Faith in action in this story refused to be told no. Faith in action in this story had dirt kicked in its face, fingers stepped upon, but still said, I will get what I came for. That is relentless faith. See, she could have turned around and said, well, there's too many people. Maybe maybe God wants me to deal with this for my life. I mean, you know, he only gives the hardest battles to his toughest people. You know she had to hear of that more times than once in her life. And she could have bought that lie, especially on that day. She could have put all this stuff into play. Well, all the other people I heard that, that, that came to Jesus was able to get right in. You know how it is. We compare it to like a waiting line in the ER. Why did Mary get right in and I had to wait five hours? He didn't do that. She didn't do that. She knew what she had dealt with. But she knew that it could get stopped because it says in this story, and when she had heard of Jesus, that tells me for her to make that journey, knowing in that time she was unclean and could have been killed. She had to hear something good about Jesus to risk her life. I mean, in her eyes, what do I have to lose? I've already spent all that I had. I mean, this can't get any worse. It can only get better, and I know how it's going to get better. I've heard of this man named Jesus, and he's sitting here laying hands upon people with leprosy and body parts and fingers and skins growing back, and they're going back and telling the other lepers, and they're coming to meet Jesus. What do I have to lose? Nothing. What do I have to gain? My healing. And she went and she got it. She could have turned around and said, well, there's just too many people. Maybe God just wants me to deal with this again. You know, he only gives the hardest battles to the toughest soldiers. My friends, that whole thing starts with a big capital L. Lies from the pit of hell is what they are. See, she had heard of the goodness of Jesus in operation and went and got her healing. Her faith spoke what she wanted, and she went and acted upon that speech. Why? Faith was seen in this story. Got another one. What about Mark chapter 2, verses 1 through 12? Mark chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. Several days later, Jesus returned to Capernaum, and the news quickly spread that he was back in town. Soon there were so many people crowded inside the house to hear him that there was no more room, even outside the door. While Jesus was preaching the word of God, four men arrived carrying a paralyzed man. But when they realized that they couldn't get near him because of the crowd, they went up on top of the house and tore away the roof above Jesus' head. (laughs) And when they had broken through, they lowered the paralyzed man on his stretcher right down in front of him. Listen to this. When Jesus saw the extent of their faith, that tells me that faith can be seen, and it tells me faith refuses to say no. I mean, it's obvious. Most people would have been like, they, w- they would have, you know, all four of them would have got together. How are we, we going to tell them this? You going to break it to them? I ain't going to break it to them. You tell them. Anyway, rock, paper, scissor this thing. How, they, how are we going to do this? Then they look at the paralyzed friend and have to break the news. Maybe, man, some other time. You know, I, I, I'm sorry. Do you hear any of that in this story? <laughs> you ain't talking these four crazy friends out of getting their friend to Jesus to the point that they climb on top of the roof. They don't care if the owner has insurance or not. They don't care how it's going to get fixed. They are not asking for an IOU. They just want to get their friend to Jesus. 
When Jesus saw the extent of their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, My son, your sins are now forgiven. This offended some of the religious scholars who were present. They reasoned among themselves, who does he think he is to speak this way? This is blasphemy for sure. Only God himself can forgive sins. But Jesus supernaturally perceived their thoughts and said to them, why are you being so skeptical? Which is easier to say to this paralyzed man? Your sins are now forgiven or stand up and walk? Basically what Jesus is saying, hey, is one harder than the other? Because I got the power to do both. I mean, the same power that that comes out of my mouth and saying, sons, your sins are forgiven, is the same power that's saying, get up and walk. You're free. That I have the power to do both. So he says, I say to this man, stand up, pick up your stretcher and walk home. Immediately the man was healed and sprang to his feet in front of everyone and left for home. When the crowd witnessed this miracle, they were awestruck. They shouted praises to God and said, we've never seen anything like this before. Again, Jesus was able to see the extent of their faith. Not only the faith of the four crazy friends, but the faith of the man that was brought in on the mat because he could have told his friends, no, let's go home. They could have quit and went home the moment that they saw that their house was crowded with people and there was no way in. But faith said, we're climbing the roof. Faith said, we're climbing the roof on this one. We came to get healed, and that's exactly what we're going to get no matter what the obstacles stand before us look like. Faith acted upon, brought the results of healing, and this man being able to enjoy the legs that the Father had put on him from the very beginning of time. Jesus just said, when I left heaven, that's not what, that's not what creation looked like. When I left heaven, my Father doesn't make mistakes. When he puts legs on people, he puts legs on people. Right here, this ain't going to work for me because I've been told to bring heaven to earth. So this man's going to walk and use those legs. Do you realize that the Father's heart has never changed? He wants us to do the same. God never put cancer in people in the beginning. Why are we sitting there tolerating it? And it could be with anything. I mean, I mean, if you really want to go as far as this, we sit here and talk about people, but I know you deal with a lot of animals. How many animals do you come up with that end up in, uh, uh, dealing with problems? Or maybe we'll have a birth defect or whatever it is. Guess what? God did not send that animal to earth with birth defects. He doesn't have any to put on that animal. He doesn't have any to put on the humans that he creates, which is his family, his children. So why are we tolerating? We've been called to right the wrongness in people's bodies and in their spirits. That's why we get them born again, and that's why we tell them that there is a God who heals and that God lives in me. In the name of Jesus Christ, be healed. What is that? Faith. It's faith in the word that you'll act upon. See, you see, faith is more than just talk. It contains talk and action. It puts the word of God into one's mouth and then acts upon that word that is being spoken. Faith acted upon brings the desired results. Faith acted upon brings the desired results. James chapter 2, verse 18, it says, But someone may say, You claim to have faith, and I have good works. Show me your alleged faith without the works. If you can, and I will show you my faith by my works, that is, by what I do. That's the amplified. The message says this. I like this. I already hear one of you agreeing by saying, sounds good. You can take care of the faith department. I'll handle the works department. Not so fast. You can have no more, you can no more show me your works apart from your faith than I can show you my faith apart from my works. Faith and works, works and faith, fit together hand in glove. That is good. Man, I like that. They fit together hand in glove. In other words, faith is more than, more than talk. It is action or demonstration of what you say or come into agreement with concerning the word. See, the Weymouth translation of James 2.18, it says, Prove to me your faith apart from corresponding actions, and I will prove mine to you by my actions. In other words, what's that old saying? Put your money. Yeah. Prove to me your faith apart from corresponding actions, and I will prove mine to you by my actions. Luke 5.20 says, see in the demonstration of their faith, Jesus said to the paraplegic man, my friend, your sins are forgiven. 
Huh. Seeing the demonstration of their faith. That tells me that they were doing something. They weren't standing still. They weren't uh, standing idle, so to speak. Again, their faith was seen in demonstration. They refused no for an answer. They never gave up on their desire to get healed. James 2.17 says, so then faith that doesn't involve action is phony. I like that one. That's the passion. It says, so then faith that doesn't involve action is phony. That's James 2.17. And the Amplified, it says, so to faith, if it does not have works to back it up, is by itself dead or inoperative and ineffective. I like that. The Good News Bible says, so it is with faith. If it is alone and includes no action, then it is dead. See, we have an alive Jesus with him, alive, living in us. See, Jesus is alive and so is his faith. And where is that faith at and where is Jesus at? On the inside of us. You can't say you have dead faith, then you must have a dead Jesus. Because in Galatians 2.20, it talks about, now I'm doing this by the faith of the Son of God. That's been transmitted. It's been transferred to me. See, faith puts action to his words or commands, and it gets the job done at any cost. It refuses to back down to any enemy and be scared to stand face to face with the enemy itself. Faith is confident in the one who you became one with the person of resurrection and life. It doesn't flinch, it stays in peace, and it is always a doer of the word. I like what Mark Hankins said right here. It says, the spirit of faith is more than just a formula. It is a fire in the spirit of man. I'm going to say that again. It says, the spirit of faith is more than just a formula. It is a fire in the spirit of man. That fire will get you moving. That fire will put some action in your steps. See, faith in action is actually just acting upon the word of God. It's acting like God told you the truth and he cannot lie. Why? Because then what you read in the word when it says to do something, you'll actually go and do it. You won't second guess it. You won't second guess it at all. John chapter 14, verse 12, it says, I tell you this timeless truth. The person who follows me in faith, believing in me, will do the same mighty miracles that I do. Now listen right here before I finish it. Jesus just sat there and said, if you believe in me, how many of us believe in Jesus? Then the same mighty miracles he was doing, stop right there. What was those same mighty miracles that he was doing? Raising the dead. Casting out demons and devils, healing the sick. All that is faith in action. And he sat there and said, if you believe in me, you'll do that stuff. But then he doesn't stop there. But then he says, but then you'll even do even greater. You'll even do greater. See, faith will take Jesus as his word and start looking for opportunities to act upon the word and operate in miracles. Faith will lay hands upon the sick, raise the dead, cast out demons and devils. It will speak to the weather. Matthew chapter 14, verses 25 through 29. At about 4 o'clock in the morning, Jesus came to them walking on the waves. When the disciples saw him walking on top of the water, they were terrified and screamed, A ghost! Then Jesus said, Be brave and don't be afraid. I am here. Peter shouted out, Lord, if it's really you, then have me join you on the water. My friends, that's faith. Because Peter said, he could have said, Jesus, if that's really you, how about you come visit us in the boat? He said, Jesus, if that's really you, have me come out onto the water with you. And we know how it is. There's 12 disciples in the boat, and Jesus gave the word come. And how many got out and how many were left in the boat? One got out, 11 in the boat. And I guarantee you that word come was for more than just Peter. You think if the other 11 got out, Jesus would have said, hey, no, 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 no. I'm only talking to Pete right here. No. Everybody, when they talk about that, went, oh, he sank. When's the last time you walked on water? (laughs) Mic drop. Enough said. Who cares if he sank? 
He walked on water. Jesus gave the command to come. Faith acted upon that word, and it got out on the water and walked. My friends, that is faith. You know the rest of the story and how Jesus said that, you know, what little faith you have to Peter. But listen, but when he got out of the boat, put in action to the command of Jesus, the man walked on the water towards Jesus. It was faith in the command of Jesus that got him to put his weight from the boat to the water. That is faith acted upon. What about Matthew chapter 15, verses 21 through 28? It says, then Jesus left and went north into the non-Jewish region of Lebanon, not down the road, not that one. <laughs> he encountered there a Canaanite woman who shouted out to him, Lord, son of David, show mercy to me. My daughter is horribly affected by a demon that torments her, but Jesus never, but, but Jesus never answered her. So his disciples said then to him, why do you ignore this woman who's been crying out to us? Jesus said, I've only been sent to the lost sheep of Israel. But she came and bowed down before him and said, Lord, help me. Jesus responded, it's not right for a man to take bread from his children and throw it out to the dogs. You're right, Lord, she replied. But even puppies get to eat the crumbs that fall from the prince's table. Then Jesus answered her, dear woman, your faith is strong. What you desire will be done for you. And at that very moment, her daughter was instantly set free from demonic torment. She could have left the first time. It says that she had been crying out. You think that that's the first time that she was trying to get Jesus' attention? No. She could have gave up miles ago, minutes ago, hours ago, days ago, weeks ago. Who knows how long she was followed before the disciples finally say, Jesus, will you get rid of this woman? But she didn't. She was persistent, and she refused no for an answer. What did she keep pressing in towards? Faith that her daughter would be healed. Now, what was the end result? She, she got what she came for. Faith doesn't give up. See, this mother of this demon-possessed child was not willing to walk away without the child being delivered by Jesus. She was refusing to be told, no, faith doesn't quit or give up. It might look ugly, but it gets the job done. This mother was persistent, and she pressed in to get what she desired. See, faith is talking and moving. It's moving and talking. Faith goes hand in hand with speaking and moving. Faith is not silent, but it is not standing still either. Faith speaks and acts upon the word of God. When the 70 missionaries, this is Luke chapter 10, verse 17. Luke 10, 17. When the 70 missionaries returned to Jesus, they were ecstatic with joy, telling him, Lord, even the demons obeyed us when we commanded them in your name. Why? Because Jesus gave them a command. He told them to go do something. And guess what? They did it. They came back ecstatic, filled with joy. Then Jesus got filled with joy and said, it's great that this has happened. But you know what's even greater? That your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. But they still came back excited and ecstatic with joy, exciting Jesus. Why? Because they got the results that Jesus said they would get if they'll do these things. Why? They acted in faith. When acted upon the word, they acted in faith. See, these guys operated in faith. They were given authority to, by Jesus to cast out demons. They could have just stayed home and did nothing with the command that Jesus gave, but they didn't. They believed in what Jesus said to them and went and casted out demons. They acted upon the words of Jesus and got the results that Jesus said that they would get. See, faith is simply an act. Faith is acting on the word of God. Faith says, I believe the word and I'm going to act upon it. I'm saying what it says and acting like the Bible is true. That's all faith is. Being fully persuaded to act on the word of God. Being fully persuaded to act upon the word of God. See, faith will not be denied the results of Jesus when acted upon the word of God. Faith will get you everything that Jesus got while operating on this earth. Everything that you read in the Gospels that Jesus did and that the disciples did, faith will get you the same things if you'll act upon it. 
When you act upon the word, it'll get, it'll get you that. Jesus said that not only will you do the works that he was doing, but even greater. See, Jesus operated in faith, so can we. He gave us his faith to use. How do I know that? Well, the Bible says in Galatians 2.20. Galatians 2.20, it says, my old identity has been co-crucified with Christ and it no longer lives. And now the essence of this new life is no longer mine for the anointed one lives his life through me. We live in union as one. But listen, it says, now my new life is empowered by how? By the faith of the Son of God who loves me so much that he gave himself for me, dispensing his life into mine. So now your new life, your new creation life is empowered by the very faith of of the Son of God. My friends, that's going to get you some good results. See, this new creation life is now empowered by the faith of the Son of God. My friends, we got some real faith right now working within us. Faith is always looking for expression to what it's been speaking. Faith is always looking for an expression of what it's been speaking or saying. How do I know that? Well, look back at the woman with the issue of blood. She had to give expression to what she had been saying. I said, I'm going to get to Jesus, and I hear Jesus is coming nearby, so I'm just going to stay home and just veg out on some popcorn and watch some Netflix. That ain't going to get the job done. Faith says, I've been dealing with this for 12 long years. I don't have anything else in my bank account to go into any more doctors. I'm no wise better. I'm still dealing with this flow of blood. And I've heard of a different physician that comes to town that gets 100% all the time, no matter what the patient's condition. I'm going to put myself before Jesus. Matter of fact, not only am I going to stand in line to meet Jesus, I'm going to crawl through the line and I'm going to touch Jesus. And when I touch Jesus, that flow of blood is going to be completely dried up. And I'm going home a healed woman. She could say that all she wanted, which was faith speaking, But faith has to act. She had to get out of her house, lock the door, get in her car, whatever it is. She had to take a walk. Doesn't say how long she walked. Doesn't say what region she went to. All I know is she said something and she did something and she came home with something different. My friends, that's faith. Faith is those four crazy friends that took their friend to meet Jesus. And would realize that it was so crowded that they actually had to tear the roof off. That tells me that faith, because here's the thing. How do you do you not understand and believe that all these stories were programmed by the Holy Ghost on purpose to be put into the word on purpose for us? We do get that, don't we? It wasn't by accident that this story was in here. The Holy Spirit on purpose with a purpose put that in there. Why? To get our attention. Now, what did Jesus said that he saw the extent of their faith. That tells me that faith can be seen. Faith can be seen. And faith refuses to be told no. Faith refuses to give up. How do I know that? Because look at the story of the paralyzed man. They had every right to go home. But they didn't. And Jesus saw that and said that he saw the extent of of their faith. See, this new creation life is now empowered by the faith of the Son of God. Fear caused the armies of Israel to shrink back when they saw Goliath, correct? Faith caused David to run at his giant with his mouth open, speaking God's protection over him, and with the action of faith, feeling that sling. That giant was already beat before David even got there. He sent the word ahead of him to defeat that giant. Fear would have caused David to meet up with the rest of his family and plan a strategy to defeat the giant, which is what they were trying to do. Faith caused David to put action to his words. What did he say? I will do. And what did he do? He went out there and did just that. That is faith. Never run at a giant before you with your mouth shut. Never do it. If it's filled with anything, it better be filled with, I don't know how this thing's going to take me out. I don't know how I'm going to do it. I mean, I don't, I don't know. This, it, you know, it runs in the, don't, it's, this goes hands in hand with what Don said. Quit speaking that garbage over you. 
you have no one to blame if you get the results of speaking what you say. If you're speaking something and you don't like what you're getting, you better check up on what you're speaking. David said exactly what he was going to do when he went and he did that thing. That is faith. He didn't run at the giant with his mouth shut, just relying on something natural. He mixed the supernatural, the words that he was saying with the natural of that rock and that sling, and he took out a giant that no man could take out except for that man. See, our lives are continuing to be put into the book of Acts by the actions of faith that we live. You do know that. There was not a period in the book of Acts. God's will for was not for that book to end. Your life is a continual story of the book of Acts. See, our lives continue to be put to the book of Acts by the actions of faith that we live. The book of Acts didn't stop. It's continuing with you and me. What are we living and putting in there as our actions of faith that will raise the dead and heal the sick? We put the action or demonstration to the part of the written word. We are the ones that do it. See, faith sometimes is also simply resting. Well, I thought you said it was action. It's still faith. Listen, faith sometimes is simply resting. It is putting your complete trust and reliance in the word of God that it is going to work on your behalf. And because of that, you can enter in to rest. It is knowing that the seed of the word is going to work and the harvest is coming really quickly for you. Yes, it is an action. But at the same time, there is also a rest in faith. Faith will also cause you to rest. In other words, it is a confidence. It is a peace. It is assurance. It took faith for the disciples to simply take the words of Jesus and act upon them and then realize when they did that, the results that that they got looked exactly like the results of Jesus. That was faith. Jesus gave them the commands, and they went and they did it. See, it takes that action of faith to believe and go about your day knowing and having complete confidence that the blood of Jesus made you forgiven, righteous, and healed. It is faith in the resurrection of Christ that made you a new creature. It is full confidence and assurance in the word of God that no matter what you're going through and no matter what kind of day you had, You're still forgiven, righteous, healed, and a new person in Christ. Faith rests in that fact. It's not scared. Faith will make you rest. It'll cause you, it'll bring a rest and a confidence on the inside of you that you're a son, that you're a daughter, that you're righteous, that you're pure, that you're holy. Even if you explained to the Father that day just how horrible your day was, the Father could be saying, you're righteous. Yeah, Father, you don't know what I did, did you? <laughs> no, I don't, because I said in my word, my sin, your sins and iniquities, I will remember them no more. Faith will rest in what Don preached on tonight, that you're righteous no matter what. Faith will also be in action when you believe that you are forgiven and righteous and healed in a new creation and that you can step out and lay hands upon the sick because you believe in the one in whom you've been united with. Always, always, always put faith in the word and then put your faith to work. Act upon the word to get the results that the word says that you'll get when you step out and you operate in the word. What about Mark chapter 16, verses 15 through 20? What about Mark chapter 16, 15 through 20? It says, and he said to them, well, who is speaking here? Jesus. He says, as you go into all the world, preach openly the wonderful good news of the gospel to the entire human race. Whoever believes the good news and is baptized will be saved. And whoever does not believe the good news will be condemned. It says, and these miracle signs will accompany those who believe. They will drive out demons in the power of my name. They will speak in tongues. They will be supernaturally protected from snakes and from drinking anything poisonous. They will lay hands upon the sick and heal them. After saying these things, Jesus was lifted up into heaven and set down at the place of all honor at the right hand of God. And the apostles, or the believing ones, went out announcing the good news everywhere as the Lord consistently consistently worked with them, validating the message that they preached with the miracle signs that accompanied them. Well, how did they go even doing that, that the Lord consistently worked with them. Why? 
because they put faith in the very top of that whole scripture when he said, the believers shall. Well, the believers shall, and they went out and did, and that's why the Lord worked with them. What made the believers shall? Because they put faith in action. They put faith in action. They went and they did what Jesus commanded. See, faith will get its hands on some sick people. Faith will look for some dead bodies to raise. Faith will know when a demon comes its way, it's going to get sent back to hell right where it came from. Faith will work when we work the word. My friends, faith has an action. Faith has an action. It also has a rest. You'll know, but here's the thing. A lot of times you'll enter into that faith rest because you are done with your faith action. Does that make sense? You acted, up in faith. you acted upon faith. You spoke in faith. You acted upon faith. And because you acted upon faith, there will be a time where you can rest in that faith, knowing that I've done the word. I'm a doer of the word. I did what the word says. I'm putting my faith and my, 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 my faith, and I'm resting in what the word says. Well, friends, I'm about to slow down or something because I had 20 pages on this iPad and I am done for tonight. But I do got some stories, so that helps. I'm going to use Curtis and Carlissa for as an example. <laughs> Here we go. Put your seatbelts on, everybody. They were attending a church many years ago, faithfully, very faithfully. Hooked up in that church just as much as they were here. Every day, every week. For how long? That's a long time. To be faithful in a church consistently. Not hopping around. but they, 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 And I guarantee you they knew when they were in that church, they knew they were supposed to be there. It wasn't just like, ooh, this is nice. Our friends go here. They knew they were supposed to be in that church. For 20 consecutive long years, they were there. They did that in faith. But here's the thing. They're no longer there. Now they're here, and they've been here consistently for what? Two, two years. The only reason why they moved from being consistent from one to now being consistent day in and day out here is because they heard God. They made that move by faith. They could have sat there and said, I know, I know, you know, I know it's time. I know it's time. And drug their feet and drug their feet and drug their feet and drug their feet. And they could have said, I, they could have agreed with one another. It's husband and wife. Yeah, I, I know. I, but, but faith acted upon, got them here. They could have been talking for years and still been there. Faith acted upon, brought them here. No different than, I don't know if you've heard the story of Don getting this building. But every step of the way, God challenged him. He had to act in faith to the point to what? They were here sleeping within a couple of days before the first summit. Because God was basically telling Don, okay, yeah, the building's yours. Have a summit. Now do this. Now book the speakers. Now advertise. Now do this. Now do, I mean, every time after he did something, it was like, and God said, well, aren't you going to do this? And then he would get that done. Well, aren't you going to do this? Then he would get that done. Oh, man. Okay. Well, yeah, but you're going to go ahead and book the rooms, and you're going to advertise, and you're going to. Why was he doing that? God was putting him into a place to where if you will act upon what I'm telling you to do, you're going to get amazing results. But he had to put action to all that, or you wouldn't even be here right now. If you... It, it, I don't, I, it wasn't that long ago that he told the story. Ask him sometime or get with someone that knows the whole thing. You guys were here into the what? The very, Don, weren't you, weren't you guys even sleeping back there? Don was, and you were doing trim to the very what? Last few minutes before, that's faith. Because God told them to do that. When God tells you to do something and you do it, you're putting demonstration, you're putting action to the command of faith, because if God asks you to do something, he's a faith God, which means you're going to have to respond in faith. Hey, go pray for that person over there. They're in a wheelchair. 
<sighs> well, don't you know if God told you to do that, he knew the results that you were going to get when you act upon actually going and doing that? But how many times are we like, yeah, what if it doesn't work? How can it not work when Jesus said in the word, believers shall lay hands upon the sick and heal them? He already gave you what would happen when you do it. But we shy away because, well, what will they say? They're probably already talking about you anyway, especially if you come here. <laughs> Give them something to talk about. I don't know. <laughs> I don't really, I don't care. This tells me if they talked about Jesus and they talk about you, you're in a good crowd of people. Let them talk. Let them talk. The only thing that you and I are concerned about is one thing, hearing well done. Well done. If they talked about him, they will talk about you. That's okay. Let them talk. I like it like this. If, you, if they talk, you must be doing something right. When they stop talking, it's when we need to start getting more hands on people. <laughs> something. So, guys, I know I finished a little bit early tonight. But thank you guys for being here. Share this video. Go through and share this video. Be here next Thursday. Um, but until then, we will have Friday night prayer, 6.30 to 7.30, hour of power prayer tomorrow right here. Uh, Miss Tammy Hood she be, should be the one uh, leading that. We haven't heard otherwise. So uh, other than that, we'll see you tomorrow, 6.30 to 7.30, hour of power prayer. Friday, or not Friday, well, yes, tomorrow, Friday, hour of power prayer. Sunday, 10 a.m., church at the MHC. Next Tuesday, we will have again Tuesday night healing school. Then we'll see you again next week. Same place, same time, 630 for Foundations of Faith and Righteousness class. Share this video. Get it out there. Let people see it. Love you guys. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.